Good morning. Good morning. I'm Francis Johnson, and these are devotions, our opportunity to connect one with another uh, during COVID-19 and uh, this civil unrest uh, in prayer, meditation, and devotion. Why don't you share the video now and we're going to talk a little bit today about sacred gatherings, sacred gatherings. Uh, before we uh, jump into our discussion, if you have a special request uh, for prayer, uh, uh, concern uh, that is on your heart, why don't you post that in the comment section uh, and, uh, and we'll lift it up during our time of uh, prayer together. It's good to be with you on this day, June the 3rd, 2020. And today uh, we're gonna to talk about sacred gatherings. But before we do that, uh, I, I am just uh, always, uh, when feeling burdened uh, with whatever struggle, uh, including uh, the struggle for our social justice, for the liberation of our people. I am just always encouraged by the sound of Sam Cook and uh, that anthem of movement, uh, a change gonna come. And so this morning, I uh, wanna play a bit of it uh, this morning and uh, hopefully it will set the tone for our discussion on sacred gatherings. So let's uh, enjoy uh, this together this morning, Sam Cook. Um, a change gonna come and pull it up here and get it on. Change 
That's rich stuff, rich stuff. Sam Cook, a change gonna come. So, so much uh, is going on right now. Uh, COVID nineteen, uh, as well as the civil social unrest uh, in this country, prompted uh, yet again by the killing of an unarmed African American. Uh, in uh, Minneapolis with uh, George Floyd uh, or Ahmaud Aubrey in Brunswick, Georgia uh, or Breonna Taylor in Louisville or Yuri Martin in Sandersville or Anthony Hill in uh, Decatur, Georgia or Tamir Rice or uh, Eric Gardner or Mike Brown or Trayvon Martin or all of the lies that fit this familiar narrative. And so uh, the social and civil unrest is because uh, a people have grown restless waiting for justice to come someday. And uh, they are in the streets uh, uh, and I'm grateful to be one in the number. But this morning, uh, I uh, using this space uh, that we have cultivated together today to engage in some devotion of time to step back um, and to look again uh, at the word of God as I find it in uh, scripture, uh, as well as to consider uh, the word of God uh, as it comes to us in uh, our thinking from our lived experience, from the wis wisdom of our elders, from the gifts that they give us, uh, from the truth that our young people speak in our faces, if we would dare to listen, uh, that we might uh, have the fuel necessary to continue on this journey. Thank you so much for those who've commented, uh, who asked for prayers, who lifted up uh, thoughts that they want uh, lifted up today. Once you share this video uh, with folks, it may uh, be the encouragement they need uh, to keep moving on. So in scripture this morning, uh, I was brought to our daily bread, which is rooted in Leviticus, uh, the 23rd chapter, Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and it lift up, lifts up the 40th verse. It says, rejoice before the Lord, your God, for seven days. And of course, these seven days are part of uh, what Leviticus outlines in that chapter, uh, the festivals, the eight festivals that are in the Hebrew religious calendar, if you will. This includes the Sabbath day of rest as mentioned in uh, verse three. And of course, uh, when you do a study on these festivals, uh, these, these festivals were sacred gatherings made so because uh, they were given to the people as a benefit and an enjoyment. Uh, for example, you consider the, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And, and how it looked as it unfolded. The people uh, constructed their shelters out of branches and foliage, and uh, they lived in rudimentary structures. And, uh, the, the solemn occasion where this festival uh, was celebrated was, was literally a camp out. Um, I'm a Southern boy, uh, and I can remember the old camp meetings likened unto this and uh, where the revivals would go on for days and people simply camped out there. And I remember the great joy in those sacred gatherings. There were, there were times uh, for meeting folks who you hadn't seen in a long time, time for renewal, a time for uh, sharing the news, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But in the midst of that, identity was shaped as uh, we constructed one from our lived experiences, uh, whether there were hardships or blessings, uh, it gave us an opportunity to recall God's provision and his presence in our life. And we were strengthened in our faith to leave and go back into, uh, as the elders would say, a mean and cruel world and be able to uh, soldier on. 
They believed, they said it often, that we were just pilgrims passing through anyway, on our way home. Matter of fact, we were in the land of the dying, on the way to the land of the living. Somebody be a witness with me today. Um, and uh, remember that, though these sacred gatherings. And so I began to consider that thought of sacred gatherings in, uh, in trying to understand uh, and situate what's going on all around us. Because some view these gatherings of people uh, as, as riots and um, criminal and uh, an unrest that is uh, not only unpatriotic, but ungodly. And I, I, I just lift that it is neither of those. It is, it is a gathering of those who have holy anger uh, and who have righteous courage uh, to stand up in the midst of the hardship of their lived reality uh, for some protesters and for those allies who are standing with them to stand up uh, within uh, the, the privilege of their lived reality and simply say that, uh, that life as it is, is incompatible to life as we want it to be. And since we are the children of God, uh, who can speak those things that be not as though they were. And we have the power, the agency to put our faith into action. We can bring those things to be. We are just foolish enough to believe that we can, can change this world. And so these are in fact, sacred gatherings. Some would say, but, but how can anything be sacred if it involves taking, if it involves looting, if it involves rioting? And uh, and 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 I offered this to someone, and they 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 said, you know, I had not thought about it that way. Well, when when there comes a time when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you are unheard, as Dr. King said, that riots are the uh, voice of the unheard. Uh, that that you have to take up other tactics uh, if you are really serious about your freedom, as Patrick Henry said give me liberty or give me death. Uh, as, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary, you should secure your freedom. You certainly shouldn't take advice from people who already have theirs as to how you should secure yours. But if you did, the patriots of this country will be a good place to start. And in Congress, if you can call it that, where uh, uh, plutocracy gathered, unelected by anybody, nailed the themselves shut in what would later be known as Independence Hall and on July the 4th, 1776, said that there does come a time in the course of human events where it becomes necessary for people to, to dissolve the political bands that have connected them one to another, or in this instance, uh, to, to declare that, that the that the political arrangement that involves uh, black, brown, and poor white people dying at a thousand a year in the hands of police custody or in extrajudicial killings, that that is just simply incompatible with the democracy that we want. That, 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 that we assume the powers of earth uh, and, and we position ourselves in a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the God, the laws of God entitle us. And that separate station is to, to take our grievances and to lift them to the government that is established in our name, as well as to the heavens. They go on to say in the Patriot document, we call the Declaration of Independence, that a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation or to their protest. And in this case, it is simple. We are done dying. We are done dying. They go on in the next paragraph to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I'm talking about these sacred gatherings that some are calling riots. I call them a festival to democracy, to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, 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 
Don't talk to me about uh, protecting property. If you are not also speaking uh, as loudly and vociferously about the preservation of life, because that's what this argument is about. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That se to secure these rights, that government is instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed, and the governed are declaring now that we are done dying, and we will not give the consent to the government to continue to allow this situation to continue. That's what it's all about. And that's why colonists took upon themselves to loot and riot. We call it the Boston Tea Party. That's why they did that because they were protesting the denigration, devaluing of their life through taxation of a government that refused to give them representation. And that was over T. T. How much more valuable is life than T? And so I would urge uh, you to look with new eyes at these gatherings where people are putting themselves at risk. COVID 19, the major implication. Uh, of the complications is that it, it suppresses your ability to breathe. But what good is being able to breathe if that breath is, is beat out of you, shot out of you, choked out of you, a knee to your neck to the fact that your pleas for I can't breathe with callous disregard go unheard. So there's a gathering of people who have a sense of their identity as God's people who are proclaiming God's goodness despite their collective and individual hardships that they will use what voice they have left to declare a truth that we are done, done dying, done compromising with a system and let's call it for what it is of white supremacy, a religion of white supremacy, an economy of white supremacy, a criminal justice system of white supremacy, an educational system of white supremacy, a healthcare system of white supremacy, a, a world view dominated with a lie. Race is a lie. Discrimination based on race is a sin. And white supremacy is a heresy before the face of God. Peter, after Pentecost, we just came through Pentecost, uh, those of us who, of the Christian tradition, the Holy Spirit breathed upon those gathered in that upper room and they received power to build and establish the kingdom of God. And here is the first truth that Peter comes comes to that God is no respecter of persons. God is, I'll say it again, no respecter of persons. And so if God is no respecter of persons, then white supremacy must be a lie. Just like the divine right of kings was a lie. It is a lie. And I don't care who proclaimed it, who canonized it. Who told you it was scripture? It is a lie. It is not as the Declaration of Independence suggests, the laws of nature or the nature of God, that some would be ruled and some would be subject to be ruled. No, it's just a lie. And so the enlightened colonist shook off that old system of divine right of kings and said to the king, you will be our king no more. We will ordain and establish a government for ourselves. And if they could do it then, why can't we do it now? For the system of white supremacy, just like the system of divine right of kings has failed. It does not allow us to have those things which are inalienable. 
life, liberty, and pursuit. And we will secure those things by any means necessary. Now, I, I don't, and I am not condoning, uh, nor am I condemning any tactic. But what I am suggesting to you is uh, that I don't like when people take things from anybody. I don't like when people steal TVs from stores. I don't like when senators steal millions of dollars uh, through insider trading. I don't like when banks steal millions of dollars through public bailouts and yet foreclose on American homes. I don't like any of it. I don't like any of it. And I don't like when those we pay out of the public treasury to preserve and protect take life rather than protecting life or, or continue to insist on the protection of property while, while throwing up their hands and saying there's nothing we can do to preserve life, that you have to deal with the notion that you will have to have uncomfortable conversations with your children for the rest of your life about what to do when you're stopped by the police, that you should expect an unequal treatment, cover-ups, that there can be a rush to prosecute when it comes to people of color, poor black and brown and white people, but lots of hand wringing when it comes to uh, holding the those who have power to the same standard. And so I would urge that we should consider again, uh, though the unrest that we see all around us as sacred gatherings, and that we should see the gatherings that have been convened uh, in the name of the people uh, as, 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 as certainly unholy. One such gathering took place there at, uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, where Donald Trump cleared out peaceful protesters by violent means using the armed men and women to do it, shooting tear gas and, and stun grenades and the like on peaceful protesters exercising their First Amendment right so that he could walk across the street and use the church as a prop and an upside down backwards Bible that he didn't even claim was his as, as, a, as a whisper to his base that you have nothing to worry about for the religion and the socioeconomic system of white supremacy will endure. And I will use the army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, and FBI Secret Service and every police who has a uniform and a badge to ensure that it remains staunchly entrenched as the way of this society. I just wish that my life, that my son's life, that your life was worth a pane of glass or an insured television from a department store or a poll number in the pursuit of reelection, but it's not. All we get is bitter tears. All we get is the uneasy compliment that African-Americans, Blacks are such resilient people, such resilient people what that means is you will swallow injustice and you will give us forgiveness upon demand because that's what resilience means. That you have no other choice but to take it or either die. Well, there's another way. Patrick Henry said it, give me liberty or give me death. The Igbo people, the Ibu Landing there in the St. Simon Sound said it best in their native tongue as we translate, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to be with the Lord. And the Hebrew people declared it. For the enemy that you have seen today, you will see them no more again forever for the Lord shall fight for you. What did the Lord do? The Lord strengthened their hands for battle. I made the Lord strengthen our hands for battle. Now the country has a choice. It can live up to the true meaning of those words that I just read in the Declaration of Independence, or it can live up to the true meaning 
of the words of the preamble to the constitution. And those words are equally powerful as well. The preamble to the constitution says, we the people, that's all of us. Didn't say mean that at the beginning, but we have fought wars. We have through amendment, we have through advocacy made that we and we the people mean all of us, including me, in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice, to establish justice. Before you ensure the domestic tranquility, which comes next, next, you have to establish justice. And no one can say 1,004 Americans last year, 997 the year before that, 894 the year before that, and on and on and more than the next seven industrial countries put together times two, that that is what you should be satisfied with. That is the establishment of justice. That mass incarceration is the establishment of justice. School to prison pipeline is the establishment of justice. The most gross inequities uh, that we've had since the Great Depression, that is, that is the establishment of justice. Voter suppression, the establishment of justice. No, there can be no ensuring of the domestic tranquility until you establish justice. Only then, out of that domestic tranquility, can we provide for the common defense. Because right now, Best Buy and their TVs have more protection than I do. Stone Confederate statues have more protection in the law than I do. That common defense allows us to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's our children and our children's children's children, which is why I can look into the lived reality of my people and find a third good marshal to name our oldest or Frederick Douglass to name our middle child or Langston Hughes to name our, our youngest because they did it in their day and we must do it in ours. That's why this constitution was established. That's why it was ordained. And that's why we have fought that it might endure. Not so that Donald Trump could trash it when he wants, could disregard it when he wants and shield himself behind it when it suits him. This is where we are. This is where we are. Just the other uh, night, we had a, a webinar through Just George, and I would urge you, if you want to do some concrete work from where you are, you should go to Just Georgia. Uh, it's uh, www.just-georgia.org. Lots of great organizations working on criminal justice reform, comprehensive criminal justice reform, and you should take part in that work. We had a youth webinar for youth organizing. I was so proud of Kenyette King, who came on and shared her youth organizing experience. She's now a rising sophomore at Spelman College in Atlanta. But she shared from her writing about how this, uh, this moment in time has touched her and uh, turned that webinar into a sacred gathering as she poured from the spirit. I want to end today's broadcast uh, after we pray with uh, Kenyette taking us, taking us out. Uh, and so let's pray today, praying for all of those who posted prayer requests, praying for all of those who are praying and putting their prayers into action for faith without works is dead in this time. You're using your sphere of influence to make this world a better place. You're pushing back against the status quo. You're challenging the norms all around you and you're urging yourself as well as those uh, who are with you to be better. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging the problems that confront us because you will never overcome anything that you will not acknowledge. And so we acknowledge it for what it is, not because it's insurmountable, but because we can overcome it by working together. Let's pray. Oh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to connect in prayer today and to think more deeply about your word the fact that you called your people together, sometimes in the midst of their despair and hardship and sometimes in the midst of good times and celebration. At each of the festivals that you gave to your people, the Hebrew people were of such that they could forge a sense of identity, both on the mountaintop and in the valley low. 
we find ourselves, your people, in the midst of a valley right now. Lord, I'm so grateful that uh, in the midst of this valley, there is yet light. And that light is a, is a path for us, if we would see it. If we would see the gatherings of people all around, young and old, rich, and those who are poor, those who are educated and less educated, able-bodied and other, other able persons as well, same gender loving and heteronormative, those who are Christian, those of a Muslim background, those who have no particular faith, except the belief that human beings can through reason and cooperation uh, improve the human condition for themselves. Lord, I thank you for those who are gathering in spaces in front of courthouses and in the middle of town squares who are lifting their voice and declaring in the in this greatest of American traditions, that tradition was as consistent with the with the, the biblical narrative of people who persisted that, that, they, that they will see their lives improve. They will have the bountiful blessings promised to them that they will not give consent to a government that disregards their life, that devalues their humanity, that says to them they have to accept a substandard system of justice or education or economy or welfare that says to them they deserve less because of the color of their skin or who they love or where they live or where they came from. And so Lord, strengthen our hands and our hearts and our minds to creatively do in our generation, which each generation is required to do. Make this a more perfect union, not perfect by a long shot, but to make it more perfect, more just. And if we do this, if we do this, then justice, justice will be love as reflected in public policy. Justice will be love as reflected as people standing before the bars of justice on equal ground. Love as reflected in healthcare will be equal access and equitable outcomes. Love as expressed as justice in schools will be outcomes where people graduate and become productive members of society able to thrive in global economies, justice as love reflected in this world will be environmental policies that will contribute to the well being of the planet as stewards rather than declination of our environment, ultimately, the declination of all of us. Lord, we thank you right now. We thank you that we have agency, we have the free will. We have the power to choose differently. Help us to do that right now. Pray for those young and old who stand in harm. We also pray for law enforcement, government workers, government leaders to make good and godly decisions, to set aside the maintenance of the status quo and its political expediency, its economic benefits, its social maintenance, and to create a new world from this old tired one. Help us to declare with one accord that we are simply done dying. We are done dying. Thank you right now. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you uh, from King at King again, rising sophomore at Spelman College. Uh, as well as uh, native of uh, Statesboro, deep roots in the Glenville area as well um, as she as she leads uh, in this inspired piece from this moment. Uh, and we look forward to joining with you again. In the meantime, uh, stay well, follow the CDC guidelines as best you can, and let us stay connected one with another uh, as we endeavor to improve the human condition. Amen. There are. Okay. God hears my tears because I can no longer pray. 
I try to get the words out, but I suffocate thinking of my pain. I began to choke. I can't breathe. The air being restricted from my lungs is like when my favorite aunt hugs me for a little too long. It's like a knee is being shoved into the back of my throat, threatening that if I keep trying to speak, it will only make it harder for God to understand me. And if I'm not afraid of him, he will give me a reason to be. So I lay still and I watch. I watch as some play with toys, some go for a jog, some walk home, some simply exist in their own skin, ignorant to the reality that we all end up the same way, crying out to God because the blood that suffocated them was far too thick for them to elucidate what they were saying. I was asked what it feels like to be a black person in America. I said, it feels like Halloween, Columbus Day and Easter. Everyone wears our blackness as if we were costumes. Our plump lips, kinky hair, and round hips are beautiful on everyone except us. We are strange fruit whose skin is constantly being tasted and discarded. Our insides are far too bitter for their liking. We have too much pride and not enough nigger for them, so they take what they like. They want to use our bonics and dress like us until it's time to walk a mile in our shoes. Or until it's them whose clothes are being outlined in white chalk. I guess it's true what they say. They want our rhythm, but don't want our blues. But I have to live in this skin and wear it every day. And no matter how hard I try, I can't wash it away. My shadow is my twin sister. She lives with me. We are one and the same. We're too black to be invisible. We are constantly having our identity stripped away from us and being told that this is for our own good. That assimilation is what we need to succeed in life. And then the teachers turn into the terrorists but wants to be called Jesus, a savior who saved us from nothing, who destroyed everything and told us to say thank you for it because without him, we would be free like him, an equal, a human made in the image of God and not a reflection of himself. God's children celebrate life and liberty found within him, but they are selfish. They want life and liberty for themselves. They have done nothing to earn it but we must slave for over 400 years to consider the thought I'm tired. Dying and coming back to life is tiring. How many times must we be crucified and resurrected for you to understand that you will not win, that we will keep working and we'll keep fighting, whether it be with peace or a peace, we will fight because you still don't understand that my blackness is not a weapon or a feature that you can worship, but it's a struggle. You have to earn it. You have to pray for it. You have to live in it. You can't have my blackness. And as the concrete tastes my final breath, I enter an eternal family reunion. My father's name is Rodney King. My son's name is Emmett Till. My brother's name is Trayvon Martin. My uncle's name is Eric Garner. My little cousin's name is Tamir Rice. My mother's name is Sandra Bland. My sister's name is Renisha McBride. My aunt's name is Ayanna Jones, and Michael Brown is my neighbor. And I saw Ahmad Arbery jogging down the street the other day. If God can hear my cry, why doesn't America? I too sing America, but you don't want to listen to me. Wow. Amazing. Wow, wow, wow. Amazing. Absolutely wow. amazing. Wow. Wow. Well, take care. God bless. Wow. Wow, sister. Wow.